Cerebral palsy, or CP, is a pretty rare thing. It occurs in two to three cases for every 1,000 live births. It is the most common permanent physical disability in childhood. 15 to 60 percent of affected children will also have epilepsy. Some of the causes of CP do include babies who are born at less than 28 weeks gestation. Those babies are considered to be usually, they are, very low birth weight babies, um, and they do have a higher risk than a term baby does. However, that rate is declining thanks to better NICU care. Existing prenatal brain abnormalities, um, these are things like genetic causes, possible clotting disorders, um, or just brain malformations. 80% however are due to unidentified prenatal factors. It is uh, exposure to our intrauterine exposure to chorioamnionitis is a contributing cause. Um, sometimes, and I've talked about this before in the newborn unit, sometimes babies do have a stroke in utero. So pretty much any type of hypoxic event. And then postnatal factors would include things like meningitis, MVAs, shaken baby syndrome, viral encephalitis, and multiple births. The clinical manifestations of CP depend on the type of CP that the child has. CP is usually not diagnosed until at least age two because some of the motor tone abnormalities that you see in children with CP can be indicative of other illnesses also. In doing your nursing assessment, these are some of the things that you might see. Persistent neonatal reflexes. Remember, those are supposed to disappear shortly after birth. Um, children with CP often have delayed developmental milestones. They're not going to sit up when they should be. They're not going to reach for things. They're not going to crawl for things. Um, walking is probably going to be delayed. Um, all, those, all those types of things. Intellectual disability um, may occur. Vision uh, impairment, hearing loss, um, loss of speech and language impairment. So these child may have, these children will probably need speech therapy, possibly OT therapy, things like that. They often have a poor suck and swallow coordination, so they usually end up with a G-tube um, because they are unable to safely eat by mouth. Spasticity occurs because muscles do not grow in coordination with bone growth. This interferes with gross motor activities. This is one of the reasons why they don't meet those developmental milestones. Um, the spasticity can cause uh, difficulty in diapering as well. The diplegia means that both legs are affected. Hemiplegia means one side of the body is affected. The arms are usually more affected than the legs. And then quadriplegia means that all four extremities are affected. Sometimes these children will have involuntary movements and they oftentimes um, suffer from seizures as well. As far as clinical care of children with CP, number one, we need to make sure we provide them with adequate nutrition. Children with CP need high calorie diets. They have difficulty feeding. They may have reflux. They may not be able to communicate hunger or thirst. They will probably have a G-tube. Lots of fiber is going to be needed to prevent constipation. Maintain skin integrity. Remember, they have lots of bony prominences and those are at risk for breakdown. Areas underneath splints or braces, also at risk for breakdown. Some of these children may not be actively moving to relieve pressure. They are going to be at risk for pressure ulcers. As far as physical mobility goes, range of motion exercises to prevent contractures. Position to promote flexion rather than extension. And then some of these children may need special chairs, um, special assistive devices to help them maintain somewhat normal body positions. They may, these children with CP may need a special car seat. They may need to wear a helmet uh, for certain activities. As far as growth and promoting growth and development, use developmentally appropriate terminology. Help them develop a positive self-image. They may need to learn sign language if they are deaf. They may need customized wheelchairs and computers. They may need other adaptive utensils. They may need other audiovisual activities as well. 
As far as foster parent knowledge, I will tell you, if you are a mama of a CP kid, you know that kid better than anybody else. So if when you are the nurse, don't go in there and pretend like you know more than the mama does, because I can guarantee you, you don't. She deals with this every day. A father of a child with CP, he deals with this every day. That is their reality. They are the CP expert, and you are not as a nurse. You need to know that. If it is a parent who's getting a new diagnosis of CP, then you would want to teach med administration. Uh, make sure you teach them about the dental needs, since these kids are also prone to dental enamel uh, defects as well. And then be there for that emotional support. Listen. Just listen. Let the, let the parents, let the caregivers take a break and tell you about how hard it is to take care of a child with CP. There is definite caregiver role strain if you are caring for a child with CP, especially if the child has siblings. Because a child with CP, they keep getting bigger and the parents are done growing. So you keep taking care of a child who's growing every day and they are, sometimes they are completely dependent and they can't do anything for themselves. And it is ex absolutely exhausting all the time. So allow them a break, allow them some time to vent if you need to. As far as nursing care in the community, um, this is kind of more into like your uh, caseworkers and things, but coordination of care and making referrals to coordinate care when ch these children go home. Uh, include, it also involves working with schools to um, figure out how you're going to educate these children. They're going to need an IEP, an individualized education plan because they're not going to be able to go to school and function with most of the other school children. They're going to need some special accommodations. They may need adaptive devices. Um, the prognosis really just depends on the type and the severity of the condition. There are many types of neural tube defects. See what I've t already typed out on your slide above. These are all midline defects with varying degrees of natural herniations of the spinal cord, you know, protruding through. The graphic is a little bit hard to understand. If you look at the pictures underneath like A, B, C, and D, that is actually a side view. So you can see what it looks like, you know, looking at the defect from the side. And then where it says normal spina bifida, occulta, meningeocele, and myelomeningeocele, that's like a cross section. That's if you're looking straight down on it um, and looking at it as, as a cross section, kind of like a CT would do. So it just kind of shows you how the different defects look and then it gives you something to compare it to. So spina bifida is a malformation of the spinal cord and the spinal canal. Spina bifida is also known as a myelomeningeocele or myelodysplasia. The higher the defect occurs, so the higher along the spine, because it can occur anywhere along the spine, including the C-spine, but the higher the defect occurs, the greater the change of neurologic dysfunction. The most common site is in the lumbo or sacral portion of the spine. Uh, causes can be failure of the neural tube to close during the embryo's early development, and that's like three to four weeks after conception. Most people don't even know they're pregnant by then. And it could be caused from excessive alcohol by mom. Um, inadequate folic acid intake is one possible cause. Um, certain medications such as valproic acid, which is what you take if you have seizures, carbamazepine, which is another anti-seizure med, maternal obesity, or it can be uh, from genetics. The two pictures that are on your slide just show two different babies uh, with a defect. One obviously is a very large defect and the other is a very small defect. After a child is born with spina bifida, they typically go to surgery and the surgeon will repair the defect and attempt to close it. After the healing is complete, it's important that they follow up with an orthopedic physician due to possible developmental dysplasia of the hip, club foot, or other orthopedic issues. These children can have a neurogenic bladder and have difficulty emptying their bladder all the way and or have issues with their 
well, their bowel or bladder not functioning correctly. They may be difficult to potty train due to the bowel and bladder dysfunction. They are at higher risk for a latex allergy, so everything that touches them needs to be latex free. Prognosis is good. This is a condition that can be managed. So your pre-op nursing care, this kind of mostly applies if you're planning to work in the NICU. Um, but you never know, you could be working in the ER and somebody comes in and, you know, squats and pops the baby out and you have to catch the baby and you notice that, holy cow, there's something going on on this baby's back. There's a big pink bubble. So it's important that you know what to do too. Generally, surgery occurs with, uh, within 24 to 72 hours after birth. Um, it is important to maintain the integrity of the sac and monitor for any CSF leakage. Integrity of the sac, I'm talking about the covering um, around the actual like pink bubble, the covering ar that is protecting the spinal cord. You want to cover that with a sterile saline dressing pre-op. If there is CSF leakage, you have to have closure within 24 hours. You will place the infant in a prone position with the knees slightly flexed. So you're going to tuck them in and put them like, I call it like their little bug position. But you lay babies down on their belly and tuck their little knees up under them. Um, you definitely never put them on their back. This is one of those few times when we always harp at people about back to sleep, back to sleep. No. If your child has spina bifida or your patient has spina bifida, they will be on their belly. And they're going to be on a continuous cardiac and respiratory monitor with a pulse ox, so it's safe. You also want to assess uh, bowel and bladder function. So you want to monitor and see how well are they peeing, are they able to poop, you know, kind of have to assess all those things. 70 and then latex precautions. Obviously, and I said that on the last slide, 73% um, of children with spina bifida have a latex allergy that can cause anaphylaxis. So please, like I'm not joking when I say put them under latex precautions, really do it. All right, so post-op, what are you going to do to care for this child? Uh, you're going to monitor for wound healing, watch for CSF leakage. If you get CSF leakage, what are you going to do about it? Well, I certainly hope that you're going to notify the neurosurgeon pretty much stat immediately, because if you don't, an open pathway of CSF can get out, infections can get in, and you're setting this child up for awful, 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 um, C or awful, awful, awful infection and meningitis. Monitor for signs of an infection. What are we going to monitor for that? Don't you dare say temperature because temp babies don't run fevers. What did I, what did we monitor? We're going to monitor white count. We're going to monitor infant behavior. You can monitor fever, but a fever is a late sign of infection. So don't you dare say that. I'm going to smack your hands if you do. Monitor for signs of hydrocephalus. How do we do that? Are we just going to eyeball it and look? Well, nope, that's not very, that's not very accurate. Everybody needs to measure at the exact same spot. So you're going to have to take head circumferences probably once a shift and you're going to watch for increases. Watch for signs and symptoms of increased ICP. We've already talked about that. Um, sometimes um, these kids will oftentimes end up with a shunt placed because of hydrocephalus. We're going to keep them placed in a prone or a sideline position, they can be sidelined too, just never, ever, ever on their back. If they have a shunt though, um, you got to keep them off their shunt site, so that really limits. They're going to have to be prone with their head pretty much turned one way, um, and so you'll have to do some range of motion exercises when you pick them up and hold them to make sure you give the other side of the neck um, a chance for some flexion too and extension. I already talked about measuring head circumference daily because that's how we're going to monitor for signs and symptoms of hydrocephalus. Monitor INO, yes, avoid latex products. Again, the idea, okay, so here's what the deal is with the latex. These children are at higher risk for developing a latex allergy because of their early and frequent exposure to latex. So the idea is to prevent any latex sensitivity because again, as I told you on the last slide, it can be an anaphylactic reaction. Reverse diaper these children. All right, so you know how normally when you diaper a baby, you put them down so that the tabs of the diaper are like on the butt side and then you pull the tab over the baby's hip and you fasten it on the front? Makes sense, right? 
yeah, when you're caring for a child who's going to be prone all the time, you're going to reverse it. So basically what you're doing is you're going to put the tabs down on the, down on the isolate or the, well, the babies will be in a radiant warmer. You'll put it down on a warmer. It's, but then you'll place, place the baby prone. So then, um, and you still are going to pull the tabs, but instead of pulling them around to the front, you've started. And so you're pulling the tabs basically around to the butt and you're fastening it. It makes more sense when you're actually in clinical and doing it. Feed side lying position. Uh, we don't want babies to feed on their belly. So we roll them over to their side and we can either hold them and feed them side lying or um, that's usually kind of the best thing to do because they need to be picked up and loved on too. And then we want to promote mobility. So make sure that they're moving their arms and legs around. Um, make sure that you are um, even doing some passive range of motion exercises too. Spina bifida is a very costly defect. I don't know of a single medical condition that's not costly. Um, but because of the care it requires, even post-op, um, catheters, things like that, it's, it's a lot of money. So parents may need some financial resources. Parents may need to learn how to cath their child to help them void. They may need, uh, parents may need to be taught how to insert suppositories to help prevent constipation. We promote mobility using braces, walkers, crutches, canes, or wheelchairs, or even custom car seats. It's important to teach parents to inspect the skin daily for signs of breakdown on pressure points, as well as areas underneath assistive devices. You want, when the, ch when the child grows older, you want to encourage them to do as much self-care as possible. Let's talk about some Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. This is also called pseudohypertrophic muscular dystrophy. Um, I just want you to hear that word because you may hear something like that on boards or a Kaplan or something else. Um, I think it's easier just to learn it as Duchenne's, but boards would probably say something like pseudohypertrophic muscular dystrophy. It is an X-linked recessive, so it's again going to affect our male population because if you're female, you have two X's, so that you're, um, you have one X that is going to mask that effect. But if you're a guy and you only have one X and that one X happens to have the Duchenne's muscular dystrophy genes on it, you're going to have it. Usually it appears in children around age three, uh, three to seven is our range. It is the most severe and most common of the muscular dystrophies in childhood. Um, as far as that X-linked inheritance pattern, one third of cases result from fresh mutations. So it's not like it's something that, you know, has been passed on from, you know, woman to woman to woman who passes it down. It can be a third of them are just fresh mutations. Incidence is one per 3,600 male births. It is progressive. It causes generalized weakness in adolescence. And then death ultimately results from respiratory and or cardiac failure. And this slide just shows the initial muscle groups that are affected by muscular dystrophy. So you're going to see muscle weakness in all of these areas. So if you look at it, um, you're going to see muscle weakness in the um, abdominals, up in the, you know, like up in the upper arms and like chest. Um, you're going to see muscle weakness down the back of the legs. You're going to see lots of facial, um, facial issues. Um, pretty much kind of, it starts with like big muscle groups and kind of marches its way through. Some of your clinical manifestations, um, again, it's going to start with muscle weakness, usually begins in the lower extremities and it's going to work its way up. Uh, you'll notice increasing clumsiness, increasing muscle weakness, waddling gait, lower doses. Um, positive Gower sign is when children have difficulty uh, going from sitting to, uh, to standing. Children will compensate for this by using upper extremities to raise themselves up. Lots of adults, you could argue, have a positive Gower sign too. Um, pseudo hypertrophy of muscles. Um, sometimes children will get in some enlarged muscles, especially in their thighs and arms when they're trying to use those muscles. Um, they're, they're using their muscles much more than they were, but eventually they are going to um, atrophy and you'll have profound muscular atrophy in later stages and muscle degeneration. 
intellectual disability can occur with this. Um, the, all this stuff eventually when all the muscles start breaking down and you no longer have the muscles it takes in order to breathe, then they have respiratory difficulty. Uh, when you're not taking in adequate oxygen, then your heart is not going to get enough oxygen and your heart is going to start failing. This is in the like the pretty very, very late stages of the disease. Oftentimes, um, children end up either, they end up becoming confined to a wheelchair um, or just their bed. This is a devastating disease because it's supportive care only. There is no cure. And so from a parent standpoint, when you find out your child has something that's ultimately going to lead to their death and all you can do is just try and slow it down and you can't stop it, you can't prevent it, that's a blow. That hurts. That is agonizing. So parents are going to need a lot of emotional support. The whole family will. It takes a multidisciplinary team um, to help the child and the family cope with such a chronic, progressive, and debilitating disease. The primary goal is for the child to maintain function in the unaffected mus muscles as long as possible. So you design a program to foster independence and activity for as long as possible. It's important to teach the child self-help skills. Um, you want to do active and passive range of motion exercises. Most children are going to end up in a wheelchair by the time they're 12. It's important to prevent respiratory infections. What are we going to do for that? Obviously, if you're sick, don't be around that child. Um, hand washing is important. Try and avoid large crowded areas, especially during cold and flu season, which is like half of the year. <laughs> maintain maintain nutrition, nutrition, nutri nutricity. <laughs> it's nutrition and obesity combined. You want to maintain nutrition, um, try and avoid obesity because that's just going to make um, the strength that the muscles need um, that much harder. Support the family's grieving process because the family is grieving. Every time a child loses the ability to do something, families know that they're one step closer. Coordinate care with PT, OT, and the nut nutrition people, the neurologist, orthopedist, geneticist, all those people. Death usually occurs in young adulthood from respiratory or cardiac failure. And the other thing you can do pretty much is provide appropriate health care assistance as the child's needs intensify, um, like home health, skilled nursing facilities, or um, hospice or respite care for the family. And the rest of this chapter pretty much just talks about Guillain-Barre. Um, tetanus, botulism, and spinal cord injuries. Um, I used, well, I have taught the neuro unit for the uh, seated cohorts, cohort since it's the other one's new, um, and I cover Guillain-Barre and spinal cord injuries um, in the adult neuro, and there's really not any specific pediatric things to cover. Um, so you will learn about Guillain-Barre and spinal cord injuries when you learn about adult neuro. Um, it would not be a bad idea for you to just read over the, there's just a few paragraphs on tetanus and botulism, and it wouldn't be a bad idea. So you might just kind of skim over that a little bit. But that's it. Thanks.